Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheimer. Today, we're discussing advancing the rights to reproductive health care in the global south with Nabiha Kazi Hutchins of Population Action International, PAI. And Nabiha, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited about uh, this really important topic. We've been having a range of different discussions and I'm really, really excited to hear a little bit more about PAI's work and how you approach this, this very complicated set of problems. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me uh, and for giving the space to PAI and for us to talk a little bit about the journey that we are on to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights. I can share a little bit about PAI and, and, and our role and our mandate. We were founded 57 years ago uh, as a civil society organization. So the issue on civic space and the role of CSOs is something that is certainly near and dear to our hearts and, and at the core of achieving our mission, which is ensuring that every single person has access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And we do that through our advocacy in the US and we also partner partner with organizations all around the world so they can drive their own agendas with their own governments to meet the needs of their own communities. Now, you said every single person. What does that actually mean within the every single person? So men and women. And are, are you basically placing um, the all of civil society, every person in a personhood category so that people are empowered to make their own decisions. Is that is that the approach that you're taking? That's absolutely right. Our mission is to ensure that everyone has access to information, has access to the health services for sexual and reproductive um, health uh, support uh, in their own context. And so that not only applies to who is receiving the health care, which it should be everyone, women, young people, communities at risk, uh, we know that these are the communities that probably have the greatest challenges in terms of access, but also who are the voices? Who are the ones that are holding governments accountable, who are holding donors accountable, who are making sure that the quality health care that they need and that they deserve is able to be accessed consistently uh, and in a quality manner? So forgive a naive question. Why is it important to invest in this particular area of support? of sexual and reproductive health? Sexual and reproductive health, and it's not a naive question, it's, it's a very good question, a very important question. Uh, with sexual and reproductive health, we know that is at the foundation of so many ambitions and aspirations we have as we look at alleviating poverty, as we look at achieving gender equality, if we look at ensuring that young people and that girls stay in school. Uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights covers the gamut of, of support information and services such as comprehensive sexuality education for young people so that people know about their bodies, they know about their rights, they know about the healthcare um, that they will need and, and how they're going to grow into adulthood and what their sexual and reproductive health priorities are going to be. Uh, we talk about menstrual health and the importance of ensuring that um, people who menstruate have access to menstrual health services and information. Uh, in, in countries such as uh, my own country of Pakistan, that can often be a trigger to keep girls out of school, um, trigger for early marriage, and so on and so forth. And there's huge stigma associated with it. Also included is contraceptive access so that people can decide when and if to have children and that that be on their terms. Uh, and it also includes access to safe abortion, uh, which is recognized by WHO as fundamental health care. So all of this makes up for a comprehensive package. All of these four areas and more make up for a comprehensive package of what are the essential health needs of people so they can thrive, they can achieve, and they can con continue to grow. So this is such an important um, idea, right? This whole idea of how do you uh, empower people as people? And within societies, there are different roles that are defined uh, by tradition, by history, uh, by attitude, by religious belief, uh, and, and so on. And you've navigated a number of different cultures. I mean, you're, you're navigating a culture in the United States. You've navigated a culture in Pakistan. You grew up in Mexico City. Uh, talk about how do you do that with respect for different views of how the world functions? Because... If you came in with some idea that you knew the right way, 
um, you would be making the same mistake that that others uh, who are trying to impose their right way on uh, on third parties. Uh, how do you how do you navigate that? Because you have an opinion, right? You have an opinion of, of how this works. But from your experience, you, 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 you've experienced the complexity of that, right? Absolutely. And I think, you know, that has been the traditional frame of development, if I speak broadly, is others saying what you should do, others uh, informing what is best, and not really looking at the contextual consideration. So uh, it's very critical that we understand who is informing, who is deciding, who is investing in some of the greatest challenges that we have right now in development, which of course include uh, the right to sexual and reproductive health. Uh, what is absolutely critical and, and what I've learned not only at PAI, but throughout my, my career is this notion of um, answering these three questions on who decides, who informs. It really must be communities. Uh, we at PAI approach our work in a trust-based manner, meaning that we trust our, our partner advocates, our partner community-based organizations to set the agenda, to drive the agenda, to um select information and content that is going to ensure that people in their communities have access to services in their own context. And I think that trust piece is most important. Um, certainly, though there is benefit from partners and organizations abroad to bring in new technical insights, new data, new evidence, but it's not on us to be deciding what is best and what is the best approach for others. That really needs to be community-led, country-led, and led by leaders who are who are closest uh, to where the disparities are occurring. Now, you know, this is really interesting because it, it, in the work that I do in my other life, which is recruiting leaders like yourself, those cultural competencies, um, the, the lived experience of being a woman, a Pakistani woman, of someone who has uh, bridged a number of different cultures, that actually becomes a technical job competency, right? I mean, I couldn't as a, as a white person a person of European extraction, a person who doesn't speak Urdu or doesn't speak um, uh, Spanish uh, as you do, uh, a, a, man, a man, I couldn't actually do the work that you're doing with the same credibility because of the trust issue. It doesn't mean that I'm technically not capable on the financial side or on the fundraising side or whatever, but I'm not as technically capable in the cultural competency arena as you are. There are two key questions. It's uh, and, and this is the going in question, not only for PAI with our partners, but I think how we uh, and I say those of us who are looking to reframe and recast how we do development mm -hmm. and it's questions on what do you need and how can we help? Uh, and when you ask those questions, there is so much to those answers because then you get to not only what the needs are, but also what are the priorities? What do people and partners value? And therefore, you're not imposing your will or what you think are the best practices onto uh, the agendas and the experiences of others. Um, you are really in service to, in response to. Now, there is this other facet of we at PAI, we're also advocates. We're holding our own government accountable. We're holding leaders at a global stage, bilaterals and multilaterals accountable. And from that perspective, we're talking from our voice on what we think we need to be effective in advancing this mis mission of sexual reproductive health and rights. So it's it's an interesting role that we play. Nabiha, describe the ecosystem in which you operate. You have you have funders, you have people who are recipients, you have a whole bunch of people who are partners, uh, you have people on the ground, you have communities. How does this whole workflow function? The ecosystem that PAI is is a part of is is multifaceted, is multidimensional. Uh, we have yes, generous funding support from foundations, from private foundations that are committed to advancing health. Uh, we have also uh, an extensive ecosystem of civil society organizations. They are our peers. PAI doesn't have offices around the world. So we really work very closely with other civil society organizations that are closest to where the change is envisioned. And uh, we work with 120 community-based organizations across 36 countries who are driving their advocacy in their context, just as we're driving our advocacy here in the US. The dynamic is, is one that I'm especially proud of because it is one where we are sharing our strengths mutually. PAI, 
provides flexible funding uh, from, from a, our small grants mechanism. And that funding supports the advocacy agendas of individual community-based organizations driving their work to advance SRHR. So We're you have providing- people, we have, you have foundations and individuals with an intent who have an impact. And you are the specialists in translating that intent with means into impact on the ground. But then you go, when you get on the ground, you have people who are on the ground that you're working with in communities who are experts in how those communities function, correct? That, that's correct. Um, our, our partners are the experts. PAI is not the expert for another context. What we right. are doing is sitting at this intersection between global and um, country level to connect those dots, to make sure that those who are making the investment decisions at a global level are funding the kinds of things that are actually needed. Uh, and then to us, we benefit also from our from our civil society network, from our partners, because we do have access to information. We have access to data. We have access to the experiences that we leverage when, do, when we're doing our advocacy on the Hill. And both um, PAI and our partners, uh, it expands the entire network, not only of advocates, but also the network to understand what are the global policy moves that are underway? What are the threats at a country, regional, and global level that we should all be aware of? And so we're working as a collective, knowing we have individual priorities, but ultimately uh, the end game is the same. And that's ensuring that people have the right to sexual and reproductive health in all contexts across all geographies and around the world. So as you do your work, you're also assembling a lot of experience. You're, each of your people are, are learning from every day of their, of their work and you're collecting data. How do you assemble that data in ways that your partners can benefit for their um, th- their ongoing efforts um, that might go in parallel or might be done through PAI um, to also advance uh, human reproductive health. Thank you, Mark, for that question. Uh, PAI uh, is not actually assembling the data. Uh, our partners are. So our partners and the local communities they work with, they're assembling the data, they're pulling the data. So for example, there is a tool called Motion Tracker. And what that tool does is to track the government's commitments to um, investing in contraceptive and family planning services. So that's each government in, in country. Is yes, there's a there's a series of governments, whoever has made commitments to, for example, assigning a certain budget allocation to contraceptives. Uh, I can't say all governments around the world have done it, but um, a vast majority have, in particular with the aspirations of advancing family planning by 2030. And, and so in this case, there is a tool to track the commitment, track the financial commitments, what, what the promises were, and it's conveners at a civil society level, at country level, that are actually uh, looking to see if those commitments are being delivered upon, and if they're not being delivered upon, ask why. And from there, that informs the advocacy agenda of partners. So uh, I use that as an example. It's less about PAI collecting the data and saying this is what needs to happen and more about communities asking for the data because that is also an advocacy tool and informing their own agendas. So you're, you're helping people on the ground in a very specific way. How does that actually um, improve the lives um, and uh, strengthen the economy, strengthen the the uh, welfare of of uh, people uh, whose communities you serve. Do you have evidence that what you're doing is actually making life better? Uh, you know there is a justice issue here as well, but let's let's set that aside and let's look just at at the economic benefits and the and the civil society benefits. Do you have evidence that what you're doing? makes a difference as opposed to uh, communities where you can't provide that same service? Sure. Um, and and I think the evidence comes down to when people have access to health care, they're going to stay in school longer. They're going to be more productive. There's an income impact. Um, it is a pathway out of poverty, right? If, if, if people in communities don't have access to health care, they're going to be more sick. They're going to be investing more in, in staying healthy. Um, so some of these fundamentals, which should be a uh, part of um, the aspirations of people to achieve and to thrive, if they're not there, that's already uh, putting these communities at a tremendous disadvantage. Um, Is healthcare and, and reproductive health care in many respects synonymous? Reproductive health care is part of health care. 
So if we look at the full healthcare package uh, and the essential healthcare package, it ranges from ensuring access to vaccines to ensuring proper child nutrition to ensuring maternal health and all the components around reproductive health. We are advocating that reproductive health care is centered to primary health care. Uh, and primary health care is essential health care that you get uh, on the front lines as a first point of entry for overall well-being. What do you do in those areas of the world where uh, people who are in power will not talk with you simply because you're a woman. I'm re- referencing, of course, what's going on in Afghanistan. Hopefully that will turn around and, and to the great distress of, of Afghanis, uh, you have a wholesale rejection of women in service uh, to women, uh, uh, basically. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with uh, with those types of attitudes? Afghanistan is is a uh, is a complicated situation to say the least. Uh, and the way we approach it is fortifying the voice of one through the voice of many, and that's what opens doors, right? If if we are not a connected ecosystem of advocates and we're all working individually, then we've lost that cohesive fabric that gives us shared strength. And so maybe someone won't talk to me um, as a woman, but they might hear the same question of uh, of them in a global scenario or with regional leaders. And so that I think is is the critical piece as we talk about ecosystem and the power of civil society as a whole is we're supporting each other, we're validating and reinforcing messages, and we're also recognizing that accountability is not the responsibility of one, it's the responsibility of many. And that means there are many ways in to yield influence, to ask the questions and, and to protect the rights of people. So part of this is just persistence. It's not going away. It's doing it year after year after year, doing it patiently, listening, absorbing, perhaps sometimes even abuse, but continuing, continuing, continuing. And that is absolutely right. And that's one of the pieces, uh, especially with uh, our civil society partners and PAI, this is not a one and done. Even when there is a policy, when there was there was a terrific policy win in Zambia, where through the work of advocates and our partners, they were able to successfully get family planning and sexual reproductive health services, uh, a range of them on the national health insurance scheme. That was several years ago, it was widely celebrated, but there are two critical things in terms of reinforcing that our job is not done with the simple policy win, and it's not a one and done. The first piece is when there is a policy commitment and there is a financial commitment, you need to ensure that communities know that they have the right to access that. You have to be able to support demand generation. Without it, it's a line item on a budget that wasn't utilized, and therefore that line item goes away. So the journey continues even with the policy win. The other piece is these achievements uh, are not forever. You do have to have continuous advocacy and accountability. Um, And this year uh, in Zambia, that health insurance scheme is being reviewed in terms of what are the services that are going to be included in this. And that, again, is the role of advocates to show that the money was well spent, it was needed, and the services were utilized and what that did for people. Uh, So that is the role of us advocates. And I always say, you know, we're the we're the truth seekers, uh, we're the truth tellers, and we're the protectors of progress. And, and that is a long game. You know, you're, you're also pointing out um, a, a, another aspect, which I think is so important. There are different attributes that people assign to leaderly qualities, right? So a, a leader in different individuals' minds has a particular profile. They have conduct themselves in particular ways. But what you're basically pointing out is that sometimes those qualities that are interpreted as leaderly can actually get in the way. So sometimes it's patience. Sometimes it's a tidal approach, which is just persistent, quietly persistent. Sometimes it's, it's, it's cameras and, and you know the spotlight and so on. There are just these different approaches that need to be taken that are culturally determined or circumstantially determined that are effective. And you need to have the flexibility to marshal a team that has these different attributes so you could deploy the appropriate tool set, attitudinal, behavioral, as well as technical in particular situations. And that, that's a really sophisticated approach. I guess part of the the way you build your your team and your partnerships is to look at 
those types of attributes as well as the, te- the purely technical? 100%. You, you need to know the context that you're working in. And this is where EQ comes in, right? It's it's not just the cultural competency, because that, get, that again, can, can be very different at a hyper-local um, Indigenous community network versus a dynamic that's happening around a roundtable with parliamentarians at a national level. It's, well, let's talk about Pakistan, for sure, example. Sure, sure. Just as, as you were, so does that mean that in certain environments in in Pakistan, you your style, your approach would be really, really great, and in other other uh, other environments, it would not. You, you would leverage somebody else who who might in that environment be more effective. Uh, talk a little bit about how you see that part of your your team building um, activities, because it's it's one of those things that. Even most funders don't see right that that sort of magic of how you manage a, a, an organization like yours. It, it's a very good point, and and this this goes back to who are we listening to, and how are we responding uh, to ensure that we're meeting the needs. As PAI, we would never enter a country and meet with the Minister of Health, for example. We also wouldn't meet with local communities. Only if the partner were to say, you know what, we could really use PAI support in this critical meeting with parliamentarians or in this training uh, initiative with youth advocates, because that is not PAI's role. PAI's so you're not role. Quite trying to squeeze out your partners. You're respecting their their role and their judgment. Absolutely. We will. Uh, we, we, we are so committed to seating space and making sure that we're not sucking the oxygen out of the room, um, even as a Pakistani woman. I recognize I, I represent North America and a US based organization. Now where we do have a visible seat at the table is when we are advocating to our own government, to our own members of Congress here in the US to make sure that the policies that we set abroad, that the funding we allocate for reproductive health services are expansive and supportive and our fair share and are not meant to do harm. Now, the U.S. has an outsized influence, um, both voice, but also monetarily on what happens with access to reproductive health and rights around the world. And so um, that is one of the critical roles of our U.S. government policy team is to track those investments, track the, the, the policy threats and policy changes, and be able to articulate and communicate what is the impact good or bad, this has on people abroad. So part of this is that you're you're the trusted intermediary uh, to those people who have a different role um, on the ground. And you're you're providing the uh, uh, basically the contextualized information on both sides. Is that correct? That's one piece of it, right? Where we're partners and I would I would think of this ecosystem as PAI is one of many, and there are many others uh, like PAI uh, in other countries that don't that are not part of PAI officially, right? So um, there are a range of nonprofit community-based organizations where they help inform us or where we inform them is specifically on the implications of US government advocacy. But we don't really have a role in informing a Kenya of what are the moves that your government is going to be making. We can provide the strategic thought partnership to say what might be some ways in. Uh, Let us be your thought partner. Here are some interesting tools that other countries and other partners have used that might be useful. Let us connect you to that. So it it really is us serving uh, as a connector, us bringing our own experiences to the table if they're needed and they're relevant. And for us to take information um, and data and insights back uh, to our own government to make sure, again, that that our investments and our intentions are very much aligned with the rights of human beings. As a broker of information, of agreements, of alliances, of understanding, uh, you're, you're playing this sort of central role, but ensuring that, as you said, not sucking the oxygen out of, out of the um, room, not stepping on anyone's uh, toes, basically helping to elevate and playing this this very subtle role with with uh, with your people. I have one last uh, question about PAI, which is, what does the next five years look like? What would delight you in terms of the impact that you and your your fellows, your board, uh, your funders would have? What what would that look like in the next five years? 
there are a couple of things and and uh, five years uh, is right in front of us, right? In terms of the impact, these next few years are, are really critical. Uh, one is that, that we have sustained an increased investment in civil society and that civil society is viewed as a permanent, most critical partner to not only advance health and development, but to sustain that. Uh, and the funding space is shrinking. Uh, so we need greater expansion in that. The second is uh, a huge win for us would be increasing uh, civil society investments and, and civil society as a whole, those who are at the table to drive their advocacy. And, and, and we're expanding that network of advocates who are ever more connected. And the third piece is uh, that here in the United States and, and those on the global stage understand um, that the policies that we set need to be helpful. And therefore our policies in the US do exactly that, that our reproductive health financing be expansive, that our policies not be harmful, and that we are listening to what the needs of communities are so those changes are achieved. Well, this has been really informative. Uh, Nabiha, Kazi, Hutchins, thank you so much for sharing the work that you do at Population Action International, PAI. Please thank your boards, thank your staffs, thank your partners for this really important contribution that you make to our world. It's it's just such such a pleasure to sit at your feet and learn from from your work. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us, and and really appreciate your support in this space.